Hello everyone, welcome to Style of Substance. Today we'll be taking a look at what I personally consider to be the best transgender films. Now, I say these are the best trans films, not necessarily the best representations of trans people in film. There's a difference. But I will be providing commentary and criticism on that topic when appropriate, because I want to educate viewers on my perspective, as well as prepare them for what they're getting into. I should note that a number of these films are pretty unpleasant and bleak, just because I like them doesn't mean every trans person will. This is my taste. And of course I haven't seen every trans film because a lot of them look pretty bad or boring. I mainly watch the ones that I think look good. But if I have any blind spots, feel free to leave some recommendations in the comment section below. For this list, I'll be exploring my favorite films that prominently feature transgender or gender questioning characters or documentary subjects. So something like The Matrix, which in subtext is a trans narrative and is made by trans filmmakers, will not be found here. The same goes for films simply about or featuring drag. If it's not trans, it's not here. Sorry, M. Butterfly. I love you, but I had to say no. Also, I will not be including any television series here, but if I did, I would probably include Euphoria because I've been watching that recently and I think it's pretty great. But anyways... Here are the top 20 transgender films. I was going to settle on 20 films, but I have 22 that I really wanted to talk about today. Though I guess the first two are sort of honorable mentions anyway, and you'll probably see why. So starting off this list is the 1971 transploitation film and satirical comedy, Women in Revolt, produced by famed artist Andy Warhol and directed by recurring collaborator Paul Morrissey. John Cale, of Velvet Underground fame, provides the music. The film features three transgender superstars from Warhol's factory scene, Jackie Curtis, Candy Darling, and Holly Woodlawn, as a group of feminist, or women's libbers. The film is built upon a loose narrative structure, with characters often preaching directly to the camera and commenting on the situation as it unfolds. Candy is a rich and famous public figure, and so Jackie and Holly capitalize off of her fame to gain public attention to their cause. Now let's get down to business. This film is pretty weird, and it apparently didn't even have a script. This allowed for the performers to improvise and carry the story into bizarre directions. I should warn you though, this isn't always the easiest of movies to stomach. Once again, it is exploitative. The film does not care who it insults. It contains full nudity, incest, and trivialized assault for starters. Morrissey is a self-described right-wing conservative, and Warhol was previously a target of a violent radical feminist who shot him. And so the film naturally aims to mock and belittle second-wave feminism, as it manifested in the United States, drawing attention to internal passivity, hypocrisy, vanity, and corruption. Candy's after pussy and Holly's after cop. See, what I was after was something more... In between. Uh, in between, right? <laughs> uh, something more... Something Original. more... Original. In, uh, intangible. The transgender stars serve as a sort of political punchline because they are speaking on behalf of the natural woman, and advocating for radical politics that they seemingly have no stake in. But they do. You see, trans issues are ultimately feminist issues, despite the efforts of transphobes to manipulate people into thinking otherwise. Unfortunately, transphobia has been rationalized by bad faith actors who lack empathy and understanding, who frame it as being in opposition to women's liberation. Despite the intentions of Morrissey and Warhol to mock feminist, Women in Revolt still highlights some pretty glaring flaws within second wave feminism as it pertains to women, including its susceptibility to liberalism and neglect of intersectional factors, including the concerns of transgender women. Even though Morrissey doesn't have the best of principles, he still has worked closely with trans women throughout his projects, well before liberals even dare to. And to call Warhol's entire factory scene right-wing is a little off the mark. Jackie Curtis was a feminist, and the film, ironically enough, serves a feminist function. Daddy, 
You have never given them past. Women's liberation has showed me just who I am and just what I can be. Women's liberation? That's right. The sharp dialogue throughout the film, matched with unconventional subjects, subverts feminism and anti-feminism alike, providing the audience with meta-commentary. The improv, while under Morrissey's direction, is still pushing for social justice. Penny Arcade, who appears in the film, has maintained that it is ahead of its time for its politics, and that it is sort of a subversion inside of subversion, and that is what it is celebrated for. Women in Revolt can be enjoyed as a sort of weird political statement and documentation of the social landscape of early 70s Americana. It's an underground hangout movie with trans women, and it's surreal to see it unfold. By most formal conventions, the work of Edward D. Wood Jr. wouldn't exactly be considered good. But just for consideration, the people who successfully canonized Ed Wood as a terrible filmmaker also wanted to canonize Last Year at Marienbad as a terrible film. In Glen or Glenda, there may be moments of what many see as incompetence, but every scene is fueled by personal intuition, passion, and love. All for the craft of filmmaking. The film is also full to the brim with experimental editing, although some experiments fail. There is a charm to everything, and as far as transgender studies go, the film is quite interesting, as it acts as the first significant representation of transgender people on screen. But in time, Alan is Anne, a very happy, lovely young lady that modern medicine and science has created almost as a Frankenstein monster. Now, this film has the unfortunate caveat of dated rhetoric, as expected, for it was released in 1953. But the core political message that the film intends to convey is done so with thoughtful grace and nuance, even though the language and precision of issues have evolved considerably since the film's release. The removal of the man and the formation of the woman. One moment shows the reductive nature of religious protest, towards modern innovation, contrasting technology with medicine. In the same way that planes and automobiles were steps in the advancement of human history, so too is, or at least will be, social and medical transition. It's best to accept this instead of being a naive bigot who hates scientific progress. In the modern, civilized world, people lose touch from their primal animal instincts, and trade them for conformity in the workplace, military, and even private home life, ostensibly rendering their bodies exploited cogs in this capitalist clock. At one point, we hear a conversation between two factory workers about escaping conformity, but we do not see their faces, only the machines that they operate. Of course. That's why I say perhaps society should be a little bit more lenient with them. Maybe society should try to understand them as human beings. There's a much desired escape from the mundanity of everyday life in favor of something more individualistic and liberating, which can be achieved with gender nonconformity. He dares to enter the street dressed in the clothes he so much desires to wear, but only if he really appears female. The long hair, the makeup, the clothing, the actual contours of a girl. Glenn or Glenda, wants to dress up and be seen as a woman, at least in some settings and for a period of time. They view this as a dual life, which makes me wonder if this pursuit of transvestism could just be mere cross-dressing and drag, rather than gender transitioning as it's often read as, which makes sense given the fact that the director was a cross-dresser. But either way, whatever they are, the condition is brought on by a psychological phenomenon that can be reversed with the right treatment. I love Glenn. I'll do everything I can to make him happy. Still, the film does have a transgender character, who is also intersex, or pseudo-hermaphrodite as the film puts it. And transitioning is right for her. Anne was indeed meant to be a woman, and now that the sex change had been completed, Anne was a very happy woman, and a woman who was eager to learn. 
and now is accepted by society. Unfortunately, the film also employs a dated insistence on the traditional sex binary, man defined by penis and woman defined by vagina, and the now intersex normative and intersex phobic assumption that genitals differing from the statistical norm is a birth defect inherently necessitating fixing. But given the fact that this is the first film to even tackle this idea, it's a wonder that it holds up as much as it does, especially considering its status as a failure. The messages here are strong, even if Wood has a funny way of expressing them. Le bonheur m'obsède à la névrose. Alain Berliner's 1997 French Belgian film, Ma Vie en Rose, or My Life in Pink, has a curious representation of transness in children. The world that Ludovic Fabre inhabits is one painted with candy colors and decorated with flowers and glitter. She maintains a uniquely confident sense of self identity as well as a stubbornness to present any way that is not feminine. Her parents can't help but see this as a phase, one that brings them embarrassment and stress. As things worsen for everyone, the film exits the warmth of the stage play presentation. The colors and decor transition into something colder, shades of blues and grays. The parents blame all their problems on their kid and force masculine gender roles onto her. She doesn't quite have the words or understanding on why people don't always see her as female, why people hate her arbitrarily, and she blames God for not giving her two X chromosomes that she is obviously meant to have. She retreats to a fantasy world in the skies where she is accepted and loved. In the United States, the film was given the rating of R by the MPAA, which meant people under 17 had to be accompanied by an adult to see it. The film's violence and sexual content is minimal, so this rating is likely a result of transphobia, although admittedly the moments where Ludo is being slapped around by her mother can be a little hard to watch. But it's also educational. It highlights the harsh treatment that so many trans kids face. As they begin finding themselves for who they are and or want to be, their parents hold them back insisting on strict traditional gender roles that the primary sexes must conform to. Towards the end of the film, Ludo meets a kid who appears to be a boy and wants to go by Chris, but is called Christine by his mother. The two end up swapping their gendered costumes at a party to reflect what each of them are more comfortable wearing. The ending of the film hints at eventual acceptance of Ludo's gender identity. This is an arc that her mother goes through, Although there is no strong justification of deserved forgiveness, both parents have done damage. So the film ends with a fantasy, not necessarily an authentic happily ever after. Acclaimed provocateur Pedro Almodovar is responsible for a number of significant queer films that emerged in Spain since the 1980s up until today. His films are often dark comedies and melodramas with vibrant colors in costume and set design, and they often deal with themes of gender, sexuality, family, trauma, and love. Released in 1987, Law of Desire is one of his earlier independent films and features a performance by a much younger Antonio Banderas, a recurring collaborator of Almodovar. The film tells the story of a love triangle between three men, but it evolves into something much more than that, filled with passion and violence. The film is much more of a gay film than it is a trans film, which is unsurprising given the fact that Almodovar is gay. However, it does feature both a transgender character and a transgender actress at a time when that was basically unheard of to portray on screen, especially in Spain. 
But Almodovar is all about pushing boundaries and subverting expectations. ¿Es verdad que tu hermana es transexual? ¿Te interesa mucho ese asunto? The character of Tina is a transgender woman, but she is played by a cisgender woman, Carmen Mora. Meanwhile, the biological mother of Tina's surrogate daughter, Ada, is a cisgender lesbian, who is played by transgender actress, B.B. Anderson. The casting may be seen as a radical choice for Almodovar, but what it really comes down to is picking people he feels are best for their respective roles. However, through subversive casting, he aims to affirm womanhood and diminish distinctions between what one perceives as authentic versus inauthentic. ¿Son ciertos los rumores de que te has vuelto lesbiana? Si todos los hombres fueran como tú, hasta yo me haría lesbiana. Y vosotras también, supongo. Nosotras ya lo somos. Es que nunca nos van a dejar en paz. Tina is a nuanced character with a dark past and bad history with men and women alike. However, we later find out that her past is even worse than what we first thought, as it was guided by incest. Her motives to transition are even questionable, as to whether or not it was done for herself or done for someone else. Al principio yo era chico. Al poco tiempo de llegar a Marruecos con papá, me cambié de sexo. Lo decidiste tú o él? ¿Qué más da? A él le gustaba la idea. Y yo estaba loca por él. ¿Lo hubieras hecho igual? Probablemente. Okay, I must admit that it's not exactly the most PC film, and more importantly, not the most accurate and flattering reflection of the experiences of most transgender women but it's certainly an artistic and compelling one. Senorita is an overlooked film by the talented Isabel Sandoval, a transgender Filipino woman and a writer, director, and actress who resides in the United States. You might be familiar with her recent work directing an episode of Under the Banner of Heaven. In Senorita, she plays Donna, a transgender sex worker from Manila, the capital city of the Philippines. In efforts to leave prostitution behind, she travels overseas to care for her friend's son for a year. However, Donna is unable to escape her past, as the town mayor has links to one of her old clients. She soon finds herself caught in a web of politics, crime, and double lives. It's a web she is trapped in, but also a web she has in some ways helped spin. Knowing the context of the director makes Senorita even more intriguing, given the fact that the film contains autobiographical elements. At the time of the film's release, Sandoval was not publicly out as transgender, and playing the role seems to have helped affirm her identity as a woman. Because the film was made during a paradigm shift between modes of identification, we are treated to an insightful perspective, it's someone finally engaging with their transness, actualizing an approximation of it through art, and doing it with proud expression, yet also openly displaying the fears and anxieties that come with transitioning, and what life may look like after that. The context may make the film a fascinating case study, but the narrative works exceptionally well without knowing it. The film succeeds due to its naturalistic direction and acting, and its compelling script, how would you tell a girl with low self-esteem to feel better about herself? I will tell her that it's not only physical beauty that's important, but also inner beauty. Like the little prince said, what is essential is invisible to the naked eye. I will tell her that character and personality matter more than physical beauty. I thank you. These words echo throughout the course of the narrative, and we can better understand not only the character through them, but also her environment. Even in her attempts to leave prostitution in Manila behind, this senorita is roped back in. Her body is violated over and over, not simply through sex, but also through assault. And then in her everyday life, living as a transgender woman. 
She is expected to pass, to conform to society's expectations of what beauty looks like on the outside and within. This is what defines her. Like her body, the Philippines have changed significantly over the years due to colonization and occupation of outside forces. The country's cultural roots are out of people's reach. Likewise, the tantalizing future is a blur, like the hazy rainbow lights during the nighttime manila streets. On the outside, there is physical beauty, but that's not what matters most. Next up is a short film titled I Don't Know by Penelope Spheris, director of the decline of Western civilization in Wayne's world. I Don't Know adopts a semi-verite style of filmmaking. It makes use of both authentic and inauthentic documentation of intimate subject matter. Some of the film is staged, blurring the distinctions between documentation and fiction, just as the distinctions between genders are blurred. I Don't Know documents Spheris's lesbian sister Linda and her relationship with Jennifer, a transgender person who seems to identify somewhere in between man and woman, perhaps as a compromise to society. Well, of course, he had his problems, you might say mostly with his identity. But I had similar problems. But somehow I knew we could help each other. I remember when I first saw him, I loved him. I thought, only if he could love me too. Jennifer is referred to her traditionally masculine nickname and pronouns throughout. She clarifies she is in fact a man, when passing as a woman. Other times she just calls herself a woman. It was the 1970s. People were still figuring this sort of thing out. So the cops say, we're looking for two girls who are hanging on to each other who shouldn't be. <laughs> I yell, hey, but I'm a man. Or was it you that said that? No, I didn't say that. You said it, no. Yeah, I'm trying to help a man. You said that first. You said, you said no, it, hey, you I'm said, a man. You said it, but he's a man. And then I said, yeah, I'm a man. And the cops said, yeah, you sure could have fooled me. <laughs> she wants genital reassignment as she struggles with depression and getting herself into trouble and becoming a target of queerphobic harassment, even by her abusive ex-boyfriend and Linda's bigoted brother. While she may not be able to fully grasp her friend's experiences as a trans person, Linda loves and respects Jennifer regardless. And in the process of seeing her friend find herself, Linda notes that even she doesn't know who she is. We all go through life looking for love, wanting to be close to that perfect someone. It's just harder for people like me and Jimmy. But I'm not doing so bad, I guess. I have a few new girlfriends. I gotta get a job. Probably have to dance topless in a bar. Sebastian Laleo's 2017 drama film, A Fantastic Woman, has helped influence transgender legal rights in Chile. The film took home the Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film, and trans activists used the film to reignite discourse about the gender identity bill. In late 2018, Chile approved laws to allow transgender people to change their personal details without difficult conditions. The film itself highlights these issues that trans people face in Chile. As Marina's legal name and sex on official documents are used as grounds for discrimination. Ese asunto está en trámite, señor. Mientras no lo cambie, este es su nombre legal. Mi nombre es Marina Vidal. ¿Tiene algún problema con eso? ¿Por qué sale bancando? ¿Por qué me tiene retenida? Usted no está retenido. A Fantastic Woman really highlights the hostility and fetishism that trans women face on a daily basis by disapproving and suspicious outsiders. At times, this can become cruel, but I would not dare classify the film as particularly exploitative. Even when she is at her most vulnerable and violated state, we never learn where precisely she is in medical transition, because the film decidedly chooses to argue it does not matter. What matters is that she has reached a point where she is happy in her transition. <laughs> 
Marina, played by transgender actress Daniela Vega, is a confident and proud woman who yells in the face of oppression. She knows who she is, regardless if others accept her. After her boyfriend dies unexpectedly due to a brain aneurysm, she is verbally and physically harassed by his bigoted family and by authorities. The film is unfortunately all too relatable for far too many people. And even though the film depicts misery, it never pities or belittles transness. Don't get me wrong, Neil Jordan's The Crying Game is some trans chaser cinema, but that doesn't mean it's not interesting. This 1992 thriller follows a member of the Irish Republican Army named Fergus, who befriends his hostage, a British soldier named Jody, but then after Jody's death, escapes to London to take care of Jody's lover, Dill. Fergus, now going by Jimmy, falls for Dill, without first realizing that she is transgender. Came to see her, didn't you? Listen, there's something I should tell you. She's, uh, swatting. Now, this film is considered problematic by many and for good reasons. One infamous scene reveals Dill's penis, which shocks Fergus as well as many audience members. He responds with fear and disgust, striking Dill before vomiting in the toilet. The legacy of the scene is not exactly pretty, and this moment became a selling point, a scandalous, shocking twist even though it happens around midpoint and should honestly be obvious in my opinion, Dill just assumed that Jimmy knew, and as she faces abuse and humiliation simply for being herself, the film, contrary to what many people think, sides with her and paints her as the victim here. I'm sorry. You mean that? Don't go say something! In fact, The Crying Game quite consistently aims to deconstruct the fragility and insecurity underpinning the cishet male identity through Fergus. And eventually, after his initial reluctance, Fergus begins seeing Dill for who she is. As significant as Dill may be, she ultimately serves as a catalyst for Fergus's character growth, above her own. At one point, Fergus watches her seeing The Crying Game on stage at the bar. This is before he knows of her transness. Male actor Jay Davidson couldn't look prettier in a sparkling gold dress. Fergus gazes upon her, building upon his lustful desires for Dill in an ideal sense, only for this reductive cis-heteronormative mentality to eventually collapse in on itself. But during the song, the film is not shy about accentuating Davidson's masculine features, such as his broad shoulders and large hands. Neil Jordan isn't so much dropping hints on her trans status, so much as he is blurring distinctions between our perceptions of another and what we find attractive, and then taking those beyond the paradigms of traditional relations. The film does something similar with respect to race, nationality, and political affiliation. The film was originally critiqued for humanizing IRA terrorists, but the point of this was to demonstrate that everyone is human, regardless of their class. When I first saw this film, I was really put off by just how cynical and misanthropic it all felt. Funny enough, on rewatch, I realized the opposite is true. I actually view this as quite humane. It's certainly not the easiest film to stomach, and there's a good chance that you will find yourself hating it. But the film is ultimately more affirmative than its legacy suggests. Like the scorpion stinging the turtle carrying him across the water, people act on their nature. It is Dill's nature to transition, and it's within Fergus's nature to help her. Pedro Almodovar makes this list yet again with his 2004 film, Bad Education a transgressive narrative jigsaw puzzle chronicling the lives of queer youth that are fractured by sexual abuse in the church, and emotional liberation through blackmail and artistic representation and replication. And Rinke is now an accomplished director, who agrees to film a script given to him by a man called Angel, who claims to be the boy he once knew as Ignacio from the church growing up. 
The script is based on their lives, and Angel takes on the role of Zahara, a trans drag queen who blackmails her abuser, but is killed in the process. Soy del bazar de un gran modisto, famoso en París. La maniquí que viene a España, hermoso país. The film drifts between narratives as the film's characters become their own characters. They relive the abuse their loved ones endured, sometimes even at their own hands. And in the process, distinctions between reality and fiction continue to be indiscernible. After shooting Zahara's death, Angel breaks down in tears. The weight of the situation at hand has finally broken him down. <laughs> the real life abuser visits the set and reveals to Enrique that the film's ending is much closer to reality than previously thought. Meanwhile, the authenticity of Angel's identity is not exactly the most trustworthy. I don't want to give away too many of the film's secrets here, but let's just say everything comes together in the end. And the trans representation is not simply limited to the fictional film within the film either, as history reveals something sad and something tragic. The trans representation isn't necessarily the most flattering, but it is used in the service of complicated characters. The film argues to view all of its characters as some sort of actors. Identity, whether it be the characters or the film itself, is constantly challenged, deconstructed, and recontextualized at every other turn. Bad education educates us about performance, how people are driven by it, and how performance is limited. Representation can only go so far, and the human experience is so much deeper than that. Tomboy is a 2011 coming-of-age drama directed by lesbian filmmaker Celine Chiama. The film centers around the life of a gender non-conforming child. Born and raised as Lore, they take on the name of Mikkel after passing as a boy in a new town. And so begins Mikkel's journey to find himself. He takes after the other kids and repeats what they do. His little sister helps him keep the secret, but after his mother finds out, she forces her child to apologize to the other kids and reassume the role of Lore in a dress. In the end, they are asked their name by their neighborhood crush, and they say, Lore. Shiyama has stated that this does not mean that the kid is in fact a girl, but that the possibilities are endless. Childhood is a time for exploration and self-discovery. I think given Shiyama's background as a lesbian and growing up as a tomboy, the kid more likely is a girl rather than a trans boy, which is what I articulate in my recent video on the subject. But, with that said, Shiyama opens the door for alternative readings. Mikkel very well could be a trans boy. But that's kind of the point. Shiyama is showing how both girlhood and boyhood are socially and individually constructed, even though there are also natural biological factors that often inform someone to pursue the traditionally masculine or feminine traits. Tomboy is just as much about a lesbian tomboy girl as it is about a trans boy finding himself. It's a beautiful and naturalistic film that recalls the nostalgic feeling of childhood, especially for those growing up queer. I'd probably say more here, but the film is pretty simple and straightforward. Plus, I just wrote about this film, so check out my other video on that. Up next is Jurassic Park. 
Depending on how you look at it, Spielberg either plays God or kills God for two hours by resurrecting the dinosaurs through unparalleled special effects. This is real movie magic. This is how theme park cinema should be, thematically rich and awe-inspiring for children and adults alike. And how do you know they can't breathe? Well, because all the animals in Jurassic Park are female. Oh. We've engineered them that way. The film sees what happens when we mess with the natural way and try to control it. All the dinosaurs are genetically engineered to be female to avoid undesired reproduction. Or so they think. We control their chromosomes. It's really not that difficult. All vertebrate embryos are inherently female anyway. They just require an extra hormone given at the right developmental stage to make them male. We simply deny them that. Because amphibian DNA is used to fill in genetic gaps for the dinosaurs, Dr. Grant assumes that, like some West African frogs, the dinosaurs possess the ability for hermaphroditism, specifically sequential hermaphroditism, or in human terms, transgenderism, or transsexualism, since gender isn't exactly a thing between animals besides people. Mutated the dinosaur genetic code and blended it with that of frogs. Now, some West African frogs have been known to spontaneously change sex from male to female in a single-sex environment. And so, Jurassic Park is officially a trans film. Sort of. The source material even directly uses the term gender transition to then be clarified as being plain changing sex. Here's a little side tangent. Do you know what that weird moment with the seatbelts in the helicopter is all about? Well, it foreshadows the transsexualism of the dinosaurs. Everyone's seat belt is fine except for Dr. Grant's, who gets, if you will, two female ends of the seat belt. There is no male for the female. This is how Injun thinks things are working, and Hammond encourages people to not worry about any potential dangers, and he rushes it. Dr. Grant knows there is always a way around things and demonstrates this. Life will find a way. It always finds a way. It may be a colossal oversight for the scientists to not realize this about the frogs they use to create the dinosaurs, but to be fair, the status of sequential hermaphroditism in West African frogs is speculated but not confirmed by scientists, with many disputing such a claim. Hermaphroditism is, however, observable throughout the animal kingdom, with many animals possessing both sex characteristics, and then sequential hermaphroditism, or natural sex change, is observed among various animals, including fish. And also to some extent, chickens too sometimes. It's not possible, listen, if there's one thing the history of evolution has taught us, it's that life will not be contained. Life breaks free, it expands to new territories and it crashes through barriers painfully, maybe even dangerously, but, uh, well, there it is. It's not up to the outsider to decide the fate of nature whether it be a person or a dinosaur changing their bodies. Life, uh, finds a way. Futuros premios Pulitzer. <laughs> Por favor, venga, come. Que tienes que hacer unos quititos. Coming in next is All About My Mother, another film by Pedro Almodovar. He makes this list three times, not so much because of how he depicts transness, but rather because he depicts it at all, while happening to be an extremely talented filmmaker. All About My Mother is quite interesting in how it deals with queerness because it primarily centers around Manuela, a cis woman who searches for her estranged lover Lola, a transgender parent to her recently deceased son. We don't see Lola until the end. Instead, she acts as a sort of elusive boogie woman who is only spoken of throughout. When she does show up, though, she steals the show with her foreboding and mysterious presence. Along the journey, Manuela reunites with her old friend Agrado, who acts as a sort of fun and sassy comic relief to the story, as well as Rosa, a young nun who is impregnated by Lola and suffers from HIV. So that's a lot to take in, and perhaps it is frustrating to some. Almodovar doesn't always let us reach conclusions. A lot of this is a farcical approach to taboo subject matter, but it is also one that's built upon empathy, and it works. It really works for me. The film is a melodrama, but it provides some insight on how transness is perceived, 
both by those on the outside who hardly understand, and from those within. At one point, Agrado improvises on stage and recalls the journey of her life as a transgender woman. From this scene, we see the heart of the film is Agrado, a woman who is perhaps the most real and least performative person in the entire story, as she has put significant effort into getting where she is today. We don't know enough about Lola in contrast, just what others say about her. And it seems, despite being both a curse and being cursed, things come to her effortlessly. For others, people perform, but they are ultimately shallow, selfish, and have not yet paid their dues to be the people they are today. But Agrado has. And so she utters something relevant, not simply to her audience, but also to the audience. Bueno, lo que les estaba diciendo, que cuesta mucho ser auténtica, señora. Y en estas cosas no hay que ser rácana, porque una es más auténtica, cuanto más se parece a lo que ha soñado de sí misma. Okay, I guess it's time for an honorable mention of sorts. I went back and forth on including yet another Almodovar film that deals with transness, The Skin I Live In. But I don't think a strong case can be made that the character is transgender, as we typically understand the term. Instead, it is a cisgender man who is subjected to transition against his will. However, it is through the antithesis of transness that Almodovar examines the dysphoric feelings a trans person experiences, being forced by external forces to conform to gender expectations, placed upon them, and navigate a body with characteristics that they do not want. Shinjuku Boys is a 1995 medium-length documentary film directed by Kim Longanodo and Jana Williams. Through its natural cinema verite construction that drifts between fly-on-the-wall observation, talking head interviews, and soft-spoken informative narration, Shinjuku Boys captures the intimate lives of three onabi, Geish, Tatsu, and Kazuki, who work at the New Maryland nightclub in Tokyo, Japan. It's early evening before the customers arrive. Tatsu is practicing karaoke, and someone has arrived looking for a job. Onabi is a gender identity in Japan that is commonly used to refer to transgender men, as well as gender nonconforming women. The experiences of the three Onabi subjects in the film are similar, yet very different in many ways. The film is as tender as it is insightful. It celebrates masculinity and manhood, and the joys of young love. It explores queerness, not with judgment, but with curiosity. Though sometimes that curiosity can be a bit invasive. Though never at the expressed discomfort of the Onabi. やっぱり正直なところはやっぱりやっぱり入れてみたいとかねそういう写生行為みたいなそういう風に本当のなんか男としての行くっていうのも味わってみたいとかあるけどそうしたから本当のとこになるんっていうことは結局なんかそれとは
多分こっちはこっちでその機能を取っちゃってるからそういう欲求っていうのはないゼロに近いほどだよね、うん、ゼロに近いほどないから A cis girl may want to get married and have children and they wish they could with their anabi boyfriends but in the end it doesn't matter only love matters to them well that in karaoke Let the Right One In is a 2008 Swedish horror film directed by Thomas Alfredsson and based on the novel of the same name by Juan Odvid Lindquist. The film tells the story of two 12 year olds, Oscar and his new neighbor Ely, who also just so happens to be good at Rubik's Cubes. Oh, and she's also a vampire. Ely's survival necessitates killing, and to avoid the guilt that comes from harming others, she needs a caretaker to kill for her. Oscar learns that he has a liking for violence, and so Ely helps him defend himself against his violent bullies, while Oscar helps feed her thirst for human blood. The film takes its story seriously. It even adopts the more sillier aspects of vampire mythos and grounds them to reality. And it's a touching romance that is. Also, surprisingly, trans. I don't think I've ever been a man. Did you think I was a man? No, I'm not a man. Ely dresses and presents herself as a girl, but she shares her secret with Oscar. She is not actually a girl. And one may think that this is referencing the fact that she is a vampire, but in actuality, the secret identity that she has is something akin to transgenderism. If not exactly. Oscar, you're in a flicka. A brief shot in the film reveals that her body was castrated long ago, and that she now lives as a girl in relative comfort. The source novel of the same name explores Ely's gender identity a bit more in depth. Born Elias, she or he was a victim of sexual abuse at a young age. Castrated and made a vampire in order to eternally remain a child. He now lives presenting as a young girl. While some scenes were shot but left on the cutting room floor, the final film is less direct about Ely's origins and instead leaves so much more up to the imagination. To achieve androgyny, the actress's rather feminine voice was dubbed over. Sometimes she sounds more traditionally masculine, sometimes more feminine. And other times animalistic, all reflecting her state of mind. In the end, it doesn't matter to Oscar whether Ely is a girl or a boy, a human or a vampire. He loves her for who she is, and through her, learns more about himself. Paris is Burning is an acclaimed 1990 documentary directed by Jenny Livingston that chronicles the late 80s New York ball culture. It prominently features interviews and performances by black, Latino, gay, and trans drag performers. Whatever you want to be, you be. So at a ball, you have a chance to display your arrogance, your seductiveness, your beauty, your wit, your charm, your knowledge. You can become anything and do anything. Right here, right now, and won't be questioned. I came, I saw, you know I come. The film takes a humanitarian approach to documenting the drag scene in queer subcultures through an unconventional and eclectic structure. The honest views of the interviewees contextualize identity within mainstream U.S. culture, demonstrating a social inequity that causes disenfranchisement and rejection. 
making drag an instrumental and liberating outlet for marginalized communities. We as a people for the past 400 years is the greatest example of behavior modification in the history of civilization. We have had everything taken away from us, and yet we have all learned how to survive. One interviewee states that she is essentially all female, and therefore should be treated and cared for as such. Drag acts as a source of liberation, granting people ostracized by the world due to their social disposition, whether it be their class, race, gender, or orientation. Drag offers an opportunity to be who they want to be, and be celebrated as such. Drag inspires some people to transition and express themselves as the gender they identify as, and for others, it's a performance limited to the shows alone. For everyone, it's an expression of pride and community. They build each other up when the world outside wants to tear them down. I am I am what I am. I am. I am my own special creation. <laughs> The film is a bit controversial to this day, as some of the interviewees believe they deserved more compensation for their part in the film. People like to see Livingston as this ungrateful money grubber, and well, I don't know if they are or not. It really wasn't normal at the time for volunteer interviewees in works of nonfiction films to be paid, and the financial context of the film isn't all in Livingston's control. It's also worth noting that arguments that Livingston was appropriating transness is a bit misleading, given the fact that they identify as genderqueer, and not as a woman. Their choice to stay behind the camera instead of in front of it was to give people of color an opportunity to speak freely and express themselves without being held down by the influence of the white outsider. However, Livingston's stamp on the film cannot be denied. Funny enough, I used to dislike this film, and thought it was sort of exploitative. I mean, I still do to some extent, but I see the bigger picture. It makes so much sense why this film means so much to so many people. Isabel Sandoval makes this list once again. She is one of the most promising and notable filmmakers of today, so be sure to keep an eye on her work in the future. Lingua Franca was released in 2019, just eight years after Senorita, but showcases considerable growth and talent in Sandoval's artistic endeavors, and I am already a fan of Senorita. Lingua Franca explores the daily hardships of undocumented immigrants living in the United States in the height of national political tension. Olivia has worked so much to reach where she is, but lives in constant fear and anxiety over detainment and deportation due to ICE agents frequently visiting where she resides. Quick side note, ICE is an evil and a necessary agency and it should be abolished. I'm happy a film finally villainizes it. As you can probably tell, Lingua Franca is a very politically charged film, but it also educates viewers on the experiences of undocumented and Filipino immigrants. Why don't you just become legal? I mean, how do you become legal? Olivia works as a caregiver to Olga, a Russian woman experiencing mental deterioration in her old age. Olivia wants to secure a green card through a marriage of convenience, but after her plans with her boyfriend fall through, she is left in distress. However, Olga's son Alex returns home from rehab and takes an interest in her while also taking a crummy job at a slaughterhouse. The two soon develop a relationship, but she doesn't tell him something big about her. She's trans. That's a girl who's taking care of your grandmother. It's a fucking tranny, dude. You messing with me? I'm not messing with you, man. You believe that faggot's been sleeping Shut up. in this house this whole time? Hey, you shit face, go to sleep. After he finds out on his own, he throws a little bit of a petty hissy fit, but he soon gets over it and returns to the relationship with eagerness and relative understanding, even agreeing to marry her. Let's get married. There's something to be said about the dynamic between them. Olivia's a caregiver. She gives. But Alex is a butcher. He destroys. And it's really a delight to see the two make a commitment together. Even though he may not be the best partner for her, 
and the ending is a bit ambiguous as to what actually will happen next. Before watching this film, I was hoping that it would be informative about the trans experience, and it is, but it is so much more. Just like the character of Olivia is so much more. The film is, above all else, a personal statement on life as a marginalized person living under Trump. Undocumented immigrants must return to their home country and apply for re-entry, Trump said, vowing to subject new immigrants to ideological tests. It's our right as a sovereign nation to choose immigrants that we think are the likeliest to thrive and flourish. Boys Don't Cry tells the story of the final months in the life of Brandon Tina, a trans man on the run from the law, who travels across the country to Nebraska, presenting and passing as male, and attracting girls along the way. Boys Don't Cry was a monumental film to the LGBT community on release, but it has somewhat fallen out of favor in recent years, in large part due to the queer tragedy being a tired trope and a source of discomfort for some people. Director Kimberly Pierce has been accused of sensationalizing sexual violence, despite being a victim of sexual violence herself, and appropriating transness to fit a skewed lesbian radfem agenda, despite being genderqueer herself. At the time of production and release, Pierce was navigating her own gender identity and considered transitioning, even occasionally opting for masculine pronouns around those close to her. She identified publicly as a lesbian woman for several years before settling on gender queer. From what I can tell, Pierce still uses traditionally feminine pronouns. You are not a boy! That is what went wrong! You are not a boy! Tell them that! They say I'm the best boyfriend they ever had. Do you want your mother to lock you up again? Is that it? Is that what you want? No. Then why don't you just admit that you're a dyke? So is the film problematic or progressive? It's both. Because for the most part, it should be. Pierce isn't afraid to venture to dark places. Like, the portrayal of transphobia is hauntingly accurate. If you are a lesbian, you just need to tell me. John, I'm not. Right. Mom, it's not You gotta like... stop it. No, it's not Lana. It's me. Lana, I'm so sorry. Mom, wait. I can explain. We can work this out. I have this so thing, and I've been to counseling. You fucking I... pervert. Are you a girl, or are you not? But that's not to say that the film doesn't have its moments of warmth and liberation, because it does. Left me lonely, praying for the dawn. Searching for the strength to carry on. Boys Don't Cry dramatizes and romanticizes Brandon Tina's life, beginning with the haircut that affirms his male identity, and ending not simply with his death, but his name, as the woman he loved drives into the night. The film is quite informative about the experience of trans masculinity, both on an emotional level and on a logistical level. At times, the camera captures the body of Brandon, as it assimilates into phenotypically male conformity in efforts of affirmation. This is a camera that educates viewers on intimate and private moments of a trans man's life, rather than a camera that violates or fetishizes. Boys Don't Cry, Boys Don't Cry may be disturbing at times, but there is something liberating in its treatment of masculinity in those first two acts especially. There is always a sense of risk and danger that the character willingly and confidently plunges himself into. And that's part of being a trans man, and more importantly, it's part of being a man. Sidney Lumet's 1975 film, Dog Day Afternoon, stars Al Pacino and John Cazale as Sonny and Sal, a pair of first-time crooks who attempt to rob a bank in order to fund the sex reassignment surgery of Sonny's trans woman lover, Leon, played by Chris Sarandon. 
The robbery attempt backfires and soon becomes a hostage situation and media circus. Attica! 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 We Attica! The film is based loosely on a true story, and I should emphasize the word loosely. Real world bank robber John Wojtovics sold the rights to the story and used the money to help pay for lover Elizabeth Eden's transition surgery. The film provides social commentary relevant to the 1970s and to today. As the story unfolds, we become more and more sympathetic to the bank robbers than we do the cops on the outside. Even the hostages begin siding with Sonny and Sal to some extent. Sonny is motivated by love, and Sal, for whatever reason, will follow him to the end. Thanks to its sharp script and immersive action, the film is a classic for a reason. But how does this depiction of transness hold up? Well pretty good for the most part. Chris Sarandon plays the part exceptionally well. At first it may seem as though we are looking at a man, but no, it, it is a woman. Just a severely broken one. And she is a broken woman because she is ostracized by society. She is at the brink of death, consumed by a gender dysphoric depression that constantly pushes her up and over the edge. Well, I, 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 I couldn't explain the things I did. So I went to a psychiatrist who told me that I was a woman trapped in a man's body. Seeing that this is from the 1970s, it should be of no surprise that transness isn't exactly approached with the same level of sensitivity that you may find today. There is a question to be asked when Leon is being laughed at by the police for simply being transgender, and whether or not this moment is to affirm the sideshow circus quality of the queer subjects, to show transness as something to laugh at. Yeah, I don't really think so. Even if Lumet had limited understanding and investment in gay and trans people, he certainly means well to treat them as people oppressed and screwed over by society. The film is very much critical of law enforcement, the FBI, and the military, positing that these institutions care about upholding the white cis-heteronormative democracy. So Sonny acts as something of an underdog hero in the face of a corrupt system of government that hurts the people for simply standing up for themselves. Funny, they said on a TV two homosexuals in a bank, right on TV. Honey, did you hear what they said? What difference does it make? They don't matter. They're going to say anything they want. Let them say. Well, I'm not a homosexual. Sal is ignorantly slandered by the media as a homosexual. But his frustration with this stems not from homophobia, but instead from acknowledging the negative social consequences of being thought of as gay to the outside world and within prison. Forget about it. It's just a freak show to them anyway. It don't matter. Whatever they say, it don't matter. And yes, there is a conflation within the film between sexual orientation and gender identity. Even Sonny refers to his lover as a man, or at least formerly a man. I can't say everyone involved is really on the right page, but it's a good effort, especially for 1975. And still, this conflation serves a role in Lumet's analysis of United States social structures, as it unifies queer outsiders as the little guy. While the big guy remains in power, for a brief moment it seems as though the little guy will win, but reality isn't always so sweet. And even if one were to object to details in the dialogue, it's hard to object to the film as a whole. It's a fascinating piece that you all should see. You want that fucking operation, right? You're giving me that shit. Everybody's giving me shit. Everybody needs money. You know what I mean? So you needed money. I got your money. That's it. Yeah. Well, I didn't ask you to go and rob a bank. No, I know you didn't ask me. I know you didn't ask me. Look, I want to, you know, I'm not putting this on anybody. You know, nothing on nobody. I did this on my own. So I've had people try to convince me that I shouldn't like The Silence of the Lambs because of how it treats transness or doesn't treat it. But like, who do they think they are? There's a reason The Silence of the Lambs has left its stamp on popular culture as much as it has, and in my opinion, that's because it's a great film. As you probably know, this 1991 psychological crime thriller follows FBI trainee Clarice Starling as she consults criminal mastermind 
Hannibal Lecter, to track down faux transsexual serial killer James Gum, alias Buffalo Bill. Gum seeks to make a woman's suit out of human skin to complete their transition. It rubs the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. Lecter says that Gum isn't a real transsexual, despite what they believe or aspire to be. Billy is not a real transsexual, but he thinks he is. He tries to be. He's tried to be a lot of things, I expect. The film arguably reinforces stigma towards trans people despite asserting that's not what this character is. That no, these stereotypes are not true. The transes are fine. But nowadays the argument is gum reinforces the reductive trans medicalist perspective that some trans identifying people aren't truly trans. That it calls for skepticism. I wouldn't be surprised if Billy had applied for sex reassignment at one or all of them and been rejected. On what basis would they reject him? Some will argue we do not have the right to make reservations for James Gum and assert they aren't transgender. Check out my video on the topic. But if we read Gum as trans, sure, we are met with a lot of harmful stereotypes about transness and ties to cultural myths surrounding killer Ed Gein, who by all credible sources wasn't trans, but still we have a fascinating, albeit unflattering, case study on gender. Clarice's victory over gum is the feminist power fantasy of women overcoming the violation and appropriation of the female body by men, right? At the very least, it is gender nonconformity and the perversion of man that acts as a stark contrast to Clarice's struggle. The film is quite directly dealing with gender issues with Clarice and how she is looked at by the men that surround her. Director Jonathan Dam was male, but he subverted the male gaze in how he depicted his subjects. In the famous Goodbye Horses scene, he employs engagement with the idea of autogynophilia. And just so we are clear, no, we shouldn't assume trans women are autogynophiles, if you even know what that means. Hormone replacement therapy for trans women often leads to a decline in sex drive. And even if someone were turned on by the feminine expression, why does that matter? Cis girls are turned on by their bodies and wardrobe all the time. So where the camera generally invites us to empathize with Clarice in male spaces and under the gaze of men, Gum quite actively turns the camera into a fetishistic tool of gaze upon their own body. The male gaze, as theorized by Laura Mulvey, is a three-way conversation between typically male filmmakers, female subjects, and male-centered audiences, reinforcing male dominance over a woman and objectifying the female form. What is Gum doing here? Well, he serves as filmmaker, subject, and object. So it's not simply the male gaze or the trans gaze, but the autogynophile gaze. Oh, but I should hate the film now, shouldn't I? Um, no. It's still an exceptionally crafted film, and not in spite of gum, but also because of gum. We are just getting too theoretical in the reading. The film pleads that we don't take the character as trans, and thus advocates for us to see him as something else. But the trans reading is far too fascinating and far too informative. This was one of the first R-rated films I ever saw, and probably the first to directly acknowledge transsexualism outside of prostitute punching bags. And when the aforementioned scene occurred and Gum dances to the song and reveals their tucked in genitals, I'm not sure if I exactly understood what I was witnessing because I didn't understand any of these issues at the time, but it still penetrated some part of my mind because I honestly found the scene cathartic and liberating. Buffalo Bill is a great character and a lot of fun to watch on screen. Dem investigates culturally internalized fears about the other, exposing stereotypes and misconceptions surrounding criminal psychology and gender deviance through a caricature of sorts. If we can celebrate Hannibal Lecter, a murderous cannibal psychopath, on the basis that he is a cool fictional villain, we can like Buffalo Bill too. The films of Reiner Werner Fassbender can be tough to watch. They explore the human condition in its rawest and most paradoxical form, investigating the deepest of emotions. 
in a year of 13 moons or in a year with 13 moons is probably the bleakest that I've seen from Fassbender. This 1978 West German film deals with depression and suicide and is a response to Fassbender's late lover, Armin Meyer, who had starred in several of his films. Meyer had taken his life and his body was found in Fassbender's apartment a week later. It is said that he had been subjected to psychological cruelty by Fassbender and was not even invited to his birthday party. Thirteen Moons confronts Fassbender's demons and expresses his remorse, self-hatred, and pain. Elvira Weishaupt, the film's protagonist, lives in pain. We witness her last days as she confronts her past, but her love that she once knew has moved on. <laughs> <laughs> There's also commentary about the loss of the German identity following World War II. The German butcher Irvin Weishaupt has forever scarred his body to reconstruct himself, abandoning the man she once was to gain the affection of the unlikely Jewish male other. <laughs> Yes, Fassbender is not shy with the metaphors he uses. He compares the process of gender transition to cow slaughter, and rather graphic detail. The film is not for the faint of heart. But it should be understood why he uses such blunt and violent metaphors. This is the state of Avira's deteriorating mind and body, the way she processes the world and her place within it. Transitioning did not bring her happiness in the end, only misery. And as I thoroughly articulate further in my video on the topic, check it out. Elvira can just as easily be read as both a transgender woman and a male detransitioner. She even returns to her original male identity of Irvin Weishaupt. But this could be a surrender to conformity. And einen richtigen Grund dafür hat sie auch gar nicht gehabt. Fassbinder invites us to think past her gender, though, to see the human underneath, the human that is dying inside, too overwhelmed by life to effectively cry out for help. Love drove her to do unthinkable things and make irreversible changes. It is a tough watch, and even though Fassbinder was bisexual, not trans, he still articulates his empathy and understanding for those who suffer in this world, especially those who do because of their gender identity, sexual orientation, and love. I understand that not every trans story should end with tragedy, but some need to. Hedwig and the Angry Inch is the 2001 musical comedy film written and directed by John Cameron Mitchell, who also stars as protagonist Hedwig, a gender non-conforming rock singer. Hedwig and her band, The Angry Inch, shadow tour the more successful plagiarist, Tommy Gnosis, across the country in cheap restaurants. Her songs serve as exposition, which gives us insight into her life growing up as Hansel in East Germany. Her botched physical and social transition as Hedwig in efforts to immigrate to the United States, and her failed romance turned rivalry with Tommy. I look back on where I'm from Look at the woman I've become And the strangest things seem suddenly routine The film is full of bombastic energy, and a first-time viewer may not know what to expect and the emotions that flow through the narrative and in the songs are both abstract and raw. At every moment, there is something unique happening, and not necessarily in a loud way either, just guided by bold and inspired decisions. That the pain down in your soul was the same, the one down in mine, that's the 
The film is based on Mitchell's 1998 stage musical of the same name, which was made with musician and songwriter Stephen Trask, who also worked on the film. In recent years, the stage musical and the film have been critiqued for casting gay men as a trans woman. However, this is sort of misleading, as if one were to actually pay attention to this story, Hedvig is not exactly a trans woman, despite having undergone physical transition. The transition was more an act of emasculation to escape homophobic oppression and immigrate to the States under their mother's name. However, femininity acts as a source of liberation for her, and getting in touch with this helps her understand herself. Hedvig is more of a female drag persona that Hansel adopts and later discards. The film's ending is open to interpretation, but a genderqueer, or post-gender interpretation, is certainly invited. Hedvig is a monolith for queerness. She is, as Tom Ignosis sings, more than a woman and a man. You were so much Likewise, after years of outright rejecting labels, Mitchell identifies as non-binary, but not trans in the traditional male-to-female transsexual sense. Trask is also non-binary. Naturally, just like Pierce and Livingston, they have been accused by some critics as appropriating transness, while simultaneously falling under that umbrella by many of the same people's metrics. The film does make use of a botched transition surgery for metaphorical purposes, that's the titular angry inch, and I can understand how that might become a source of discomfort for some trans people. I guess it's also worth noting that the film deals with how abuse can be passed on from relationship to relationship. The protagonist is not exactly the greatest of people. She does problematic and harmful things. I read people criticize that aspect, but I frankly don't see how that's an issue. I don't need fictional characters to be my moral guides. But I do like to find some level of relatability, which in this film I do. I grew up in Kansas, which is where Hedvig immigrates to and where the film begins. I also find myself getting lost in the music, a soundtrack so good that I am a regular listener. Wig in a Box, The Origin of Love, Wicked Little Town and its reprise are probably a four-way tie for my favorite song on the soundtrack. But maybe the core message of the film is what rings truest. Love others. But first and foremost, love yourself. Also, check out Short Bus when you can. That is another masterful film by Mitchell, and it also features some transgender representation, just not as a significant focal point, so I didn't include it on the main list. Funeral Parade of Roses easily tops this list for its chaotic exploration of gender identity and expression. Perhaps in that way, it's the most accurate representation of gender. This quasi-documentary is directed by avant-garde filmmaker and film theorist Toshio Matsumoto, and is a staple of the Japanese New Wave and queer cinema. 
The film follows Eddie, played by feminine presenting drag performer Pita, alongside her group of gay boy friends. The film queers narrative itself by blurring distinctions between fiction and documentary, at times exposing the artifice of the filmmaking, other times bringing performance to real life. The film incorporates talking head interviews with various gay boys as well as a theatrical retelling of Oedipus Rex that swaps gender and sexual orientation. The name Eddie is even a play on Oedipus. Get it? Oedipus? Trans feminine identities emerge in Japan following World War II. Those that entered underground in public discourse include Okana, Nayuhaju, and Gay Boy. The Gay Boy identity is not exactly aligned with the common understanding of orientation and gender in contemporary Western culture, but there's also an emphasis on simply rejecting such fixed definitions, as it seems that, according to these interviews, gay is not necessarily synonymous with homosexual, and boy is not necessarily synonymous with male. Something of note is that the term gay boy is one with an etymology linked to the Western world. The word gay refers to effeminate and or homosexual men but was popularized in Japan during the late 1950s and throughout the 1960s, likely due to linguistic parallels to the word geisha. The word gay refers not to orientation, but instead to performance of womanhood. If this idea stands the test of time in gender, sexual, and drag performing identities, the boy in gay boy may also not actually contradict itself if Audiences are in fact meant to view the characters as merely female impersonators or men in drag. But the truth of the matter is much more complicated. The gay boys find unity among each other, but their interviews reveal a plethora of experiences. Some of them seem to just be gay, while others are trans, and some are just cross-dressers. Their drag personas, however, are different shades of female. We can view Funeral Prayer to Roses as a work of fiction given how much it relies on its fictional narrative. And I will lean in favor of viewing the gay boys as primarily being transgender women, given their visual and behavioral efforts to identify and pass as such. Though in the same respect, the film can just as well be seen as existing between the lines of fiction and nonfiction, and the gay boys between the lines of male and female. While these presumptions are untrustworthy by their very construction, people fall into the mindset of establishing fixed categorizations for a reason. Discourse surrounding the film must adapt to a contemporary understanding and categorizations of transness. But even that will prove itself reductive and dated in time. Thanks for watching. Also, happy June! Sayonara! 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 to um, dig up dig up dinosaurs? <laughs> well. Try to. <laughs>
Ah. <laughs> <laughs>